All right, so we're going to get started. I apologize for that uh, delay getting going here. Uh, you got two handouts today. We've got exercise 206, which we'll do together as a, as a demo, building on what we did last, uh, last class. And then you got your first assignment for the semester. So assignment 201 is uh, to design a table and a chair. It only has to be one chair and one table. I'm pretty loose with the definition of what defines a table. Uh, my definition is it's something you can put something on. Uh, and a chair is something you can sit on. That's about it. So we're, we're deliberately being vague so that you guys can have some fun and creativity. I'm not overly worried about gravity when it comes to the chair either or structural integrity. Um, I want it to be nice. I want it to be well modeled. Um, the, the key things on it are did you model it well? Were you able to, to build what you wanted to build? Is it, is it interesting to look at? You know, I mean, don't make me a cube and call it a day, right? Something interesting. You know, to spend time actually designing something that I want to look at. Uh, and then the other part of it is going to have to do with how the textures are applied, the fact that textures are applied, materials are applied, and how they look. Are they appropriate scale? We haven't talked about that yet. That's coming. Are they the appropriate scale? Do, do they look realistic? Those kinds of things. I am not asking for any kind of a background. So this is kind of like those old Apple commercials where you're on this white plane in a white sky. Uh, with nothing else, you just have your table and chairs. So, uh, no background, no context, just the table and just the chair. Uh, this whole thing is due on Wednesday, the 4th of March. So, it's still a ways out. Um, just, just, um, and we're going to go through this next class. Remember, Monday is a holiday, so we don't have class on Monday. On Wednesday of next week, I'll go through the rest of this, but I'm going to be gone the following week. So the week of the, uh, what is it, like 24th and 26th, those two class days, I'm going to be gone. I don't know who's going to be the substitute for that period. I can pretty much promise you that whoever is the substitute is not going to know enough about Rhino to help you guys do anything. So you're going to end up being on your own, uh, watching my lecture and doing the 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 lecture or the exercise that goes with it. I still want you doing it. Don't blow it off because we need to stay on track to be able to get to the end of the semester. So it is what it is. Uh, bring headphones, listen to the lecture, do it. Um, but you will need the skills that will cover in that week to be able to do this uh, assignment. That being said, it would be pretty unfair for me to make it due on Monday when I get back so that you don't have any contact with me and you just have to wing it and turn it in. So I delayed when it was due a little bit longer than I normally would have. Um, so it will be due on the 4th, which gives us that Monday, the 2nd, uh, for any kind of last minute, I can't make the texture map work or, or whatever, uh, we could sit down and we can fix that stuff. So um, I'm doing it strategically so that you guys will have that. That makes sense to everybody? So I apologize I'm going to be gone, but it was something I told you in the very beginning. I knew it was going to happen, so we just have to work around it, okay? Um, so that's it. Oh, in terms of what you're turning in, you're giving me three, quote, perfect renderings of this. So three different angles showing me that table and that chair. Don't, please don't forget to give me three. It's, it's amazing to me how uh, people lose their attention to detail and they turn in one rendering. Okay? If you turn in one rendering, you just got yourself, best case, a 33% on the assignment. Best case. So just don't give me three. Right? And this is the same thing throughout the semester. Most people can manage three renderings for this first one. But by the end, like when we're doing the light fixtures or whatever, they like do one rendering of f the two light fixtures that you need. And it's like, no, that's not enough. Like, make sure you read what I'm asking for and give me that. Please don't leave stuff out because it's just wasting points. So I will emphasize that when it gets a little bit closer as well. Um, please print your best image. Whatever one is the best one. I don't need all three. If you want to print all three, you can, but I just need the best one. To the color laser printer here. And give me one eight and a half by eleven print of whatever that is. So the best one, give me one print. I'm happy. Uh, that's just so I have paper records, just in case the world collapses on us. Um, nothing fancy, no fancy paper, just just straight color print over there. Okay. So um, I think that makes sense. If you guys have any questions, let me know. 
about this. Um, if we have extra time today, you can start thinking about it, start designing it, start working on it, um, and then you can uh, continue working on it as we go forward. Uh, so that's assignment 201 uh, that I just walked through here. I'm going to jump over into uh, the exercise for today, which is exercise 206. And today we're going to be talking about, um, hold on a second. You know, sometimes you catch things. Um, under exercise 206 on the handout, the top it says modeling components part two and texture mapping of objects. We're not doing texture mapping of objects today. That's not supposed to be there. That's next class. So I apologize. You can strike that out. Um, but I, I panicked for a second and, and thought that maybe I tried to wrap those together, but I didn't. Good. Uh, we're going to talk today uh, primarily about tubes and sweeps and kind of more curving three-dimensional objects. We've, we've been dealing with the basic rectangles. It's now time to get into something a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through it. I will do it live. I don't think that you'll be able to follow me along step by step all the way through and get to the end when I get to the end. I think I'll end up losing you along the way. So try not to overly concentrate on trying to follow me step by step and understand the, the big picture of what I'm trying to do. Understand what a sweep is and, and that sort of thing. Um, in the beginning, of course, you can, you can try to kind of keep along with me. Uh, but I caution you against that because the last thing that, that I want is for you to be trying to do something and then I've moved on and then you get lost and you didn't hear what I was trying to tell you and then you're completely lost. And so we don't want that. So just kind of track, track with me a little bit uh, as we get going through this. So the thing that we're making today is something called a spider clamp. Uh, if we do a Google image search for this, it'll, it might give you a little bit more context. Uh, It's something along these lines. So it's, it's this little clamp thing that clamps four panes of glass together. Um, and there's a variety of styles to how they come together and what the little uh, the rods look like, etc. But this is essentially the basics of what we're modeling. You know, something like this is far more uh, intricate than, than what we're modeling. We're simplifying it, but I want to have you guys have a general idea of what these are and how they work together. So the idea is that you have this little clamp you have a rod that comes out and then you have a tension line that's, that's holding the glass together. So you're using tension to keep the, the structural forces at bay as you do this. So we're building this little tiny component, the cable lines, and then also a pane of glass that will eventually assemble together into a big uh, wall of this stuff. So sometimes it helps just to see visually what it is that we're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start. I'm going to work in the perspective view uh, to start. I did choose large object inches as my template. Uh, I, I noticed a couple of you last class um, got through the exercise and then realized you were working in millimeters and we had to do some scaling and whatever. So I'm just reminding everybody, um, double check at the bottom here, right down here that it says inches. You want that inches to be, uh, to be active. Interesting. Well, it's a good thing we're not using V-Ray today. <laughs> uh, by the way, there, the computers have been acting up all day. So if your computer acts up, I apologize, but that's just, that's the way it's been. So yeah, I am in inches, so we can go ahead and start working. And what I'm going to start with is drawing the shape that you see in part one, uh, step one right here, which is essentially a two inch radius curve, a 13 inch straight section, and another two inch radius curve. And so as I start to draw that, uh, I'll go ahead and start with the curve tool. And this is one of those things where we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we create this. I'm just going to start with the basic arc, center, start, and end. And when I do that, um, the center of the arc, I'm going to go ahead and move it over two inches. So the center in coordinates, if I was starting right here at the origin, would be two comma zero. I didn't put an at sign in, it's just two comma zero. That would get me started. And then the, the origin here would be 0, 0. That would be the start of my arc. And the end of my arc, I just need it to be 90 degrees. So I can go ahead and turn on my uh, ortho here. And it's going to be right there. And so that creates that first little bit of the arc. You could create it in a different way. You could create the line first and then work from the line. I mean, there's, there's lots of flexibility here uh, in terms of how you actually create it. Next thing I need is I need a polyline. And I'll start by snapping to this endpoint. Currently, my snaps are not on, so I'll go ahead and turn on my end 
mid and perpendicular snaps. Those are the three that I like to have on as I work. And I'll snap right to that corner and I'll draw over by 13 inches. So it's just the length here. There's my 13 inches and I can go ahead and finish by pressing enter again. Now I need this arc over here. I can do the same thing. I could mirror this arc, but I could also just create the arc again. So there's the start and the center. So in this, I would want to come down two inches to get that center. We'll start right there and we'll end right there. And that gives me that piece of the arc as well. So I have this piece, this piece, and this piece. I'd like all of those to become one continuous curve. And I'll do that by selecting them and then going up to edit and then join. So that makes them one continuous curve. And of course the middle here disappeared because of that error in V-Ray that I haven't, or in uh, Rhino that I haven't changed yet. So let me go to tools and then options, scroll all the way down to view, expand that, click on open GL and uncheck that GPU tessellation option. And there we go. Now I can see my object. Okay. So I have a continuous line that starts with this arc, goes straight and then comes back here but I'd like it to be standing up in the third dimension. So it's currently flat on the ground. I drew it flat. You could confirm that by looking at it in the top view. Yep, there it is. So I want it to be three dimensional. I want it to be standing up. So I'll use my rotate 3D command. We've done this before. I'll go up to my transform. I'll choose rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could type rotate 3D into the command line. I'll choose my curve and press enter. And then the start of the rotation axis, that is this axis right here, because I want these two points to be down on, on the ground. So I'll snap to this first point, snap to the second point. That's my rotation axis. My reference is going to be going up the Y axis here. And then I'm just going to fold it up till it's standing at perfect 90 degrees. Remember, if I didn't have ortho turned on, I could hold down shift on the keyboard and get it to uh, line up perfectly vertical like that. So all I've done is I've taken that curve that I, that I drew and I've now made it so that it's standing up like that. So the next piece of this is to go ahead and draw a circle that is right here where we start. So I'm going to come over to my tools here and I'm going to choose circle. Now in this option, it's asking for the center of the circle. So I'd pick the center of the circle there. The next thing here is that it's asking me for the radius of the circle. Well, the little picture that's hard to read here shows a diameter of 0.5. So a diameter of a half inch, which would mean the radius is 0.25. So I type in 0.25 and press enter, and that would give me uh, a circle with a diameter of a half inch or a radius of a quarter inch. Alternatively, when you're creating that circle, you could, there I am, switch to diameter mode and type in 0.5 since you know that it's the diameter of 0.5. So pay attention on this exercise as to whether I'm telling you what the diameter is or what the radius is so that these little um, pieces aren't too big. Okay. So what I have now is I have something that's a curve and I have something that defines the cross section of an ultimate shape. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a command called a sweep. And what a sweep does is it takes a curve, so in this case, this curve here, and it calls that a rail. And it's kind of like, you could think of it like a railroad track. You have a train running on a railroad track, and there's a rail on one side. That train's going to stay on the track, and it's just going to keep following it. So what we're doing here is we're saying, I want this curve to follow this rail and give me a surface as it follows along. So it's kind of like the follow me tool in SketchUp, if you've worked with that before, though it works a whole lot better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my um, surface and I'm going to choose to sweep one rail. Alternatively, I could type in sweep one and I'll go ahead and the first thing it asks me is to select the rail. So the rail in this case is this curve right here. I'll go ahead and press, oh, I don't have to press enter because I'm only selecting one curve. Then it asks me to select the cross section curve. So the cross section curve would be this curve right here, that little circle. When I'm done now, I'll go ahead and press enter. It asks me, do I want to drag the seam to adjust? 
This is just where the seam of the surface would be. The default is almost always just fine. So we're going to leave it right where it is. That's fine. And we'll go ahead and press Enter. This then brings up the Sweep One Rail Options dialog box. So by default, the frame style is called Freeform. And I'll explain the difference of these a little bit better uh, when I do some other examples here. But essentially, that means as this curve happens, follow along with the curve, with that cross section, and make it look kind of like a pipe. So we'll stick with that. I'll explain road like in a little bit. And we'll go ahead and come down here. The rest of the options are just fine. And we'll go ahead and say OK. And what I end up with, if I switch to shaded mode, is essentially a tube that follows along that cross section or that, um, that rail that defines what this little tube should look like. So that was a very um, controlled example. You know, alternate, al alternate to that, right? I could take, oops, sorry about that, wrong view. Come back into perspective here. I could make any curve that I wanted like this. And I could start with a cross-sectional curve like that. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Let's say it's something like that. Now, in this, in this context here, oops, the cross-sectional curve is flat compared to this curve, so I need to rotate that up. So let me take the cross-sectional curve here. It's either the cross-sectional curve or it's this curve. One of them has to rotate up. Um, so I'll just take the cross-sectional curve. We'll rotate that 3D. So I'll go to Transform, Rotate 3D. All right, so now that's standing up. And if I go back to the Sweep 1, I can go in here to my Surface Sweep 1 Rail. I can choose my Rail, then my Cross-Sectional Curve, and press Enter. There's the seam. And then it will build that in whatever shape it is that I want. So that's flat still. If I take this curve and I change it and I manipulate some of these control points, let me go ahead and move them vertically. We'll pull those up. And maybe we'll pull these two up a little bit too. OK, so now that same curve is now going up and down in space. I can do the same sweep. So I can go into Surface. I can go to Sweep One Rail, Rail cross-sectional curve, enter, enter, and now it's created you know, a three-dimensional little pipe there. Does that make sense so far? OK, so what's, what about if my cross-sectional curve isn't a pipe anymore? So let's say instead of a pipe, I say, I want something that's a rectangle. So let me do a rectangle. And again, I'm exaggerating some of this so you guys can see it here a little bit. Let me delete that. I need to do some rotations on this one to get it to, to fall right. Let me rotate 3D. And in this context, I'm going to fold it down so it's below where we're starting here. And I'm also going to rotate this a little bit with a regular rotation. So let me go to Transform and then Regular Rotate. And I'm just going to pull that over so it's a little more perpendicular to where I start. So now I can do the same thing. I can do my sweep one rail. So I'll go up to surface, sweep run one rail. There's my rail. There's my cross-sectional curve. When I press Enter, we're going to start to see some differences. So right here, my frame style is set as freeform. And so if you look at this, as it starts to come up, you see how it kind of arcs around the curve. And then it arcs back, and then it ends up right here, such that my ending point is on an angle where this is flat. If I switch to road-like, it's going to keep this like a path, where the top is always going to be flat. So instead of being able to twist and bank, it's going to keep that uh, stationary surface as it goes up and down, which may or may not be what you want from a modeling standpoint. But the point is that there's a distinct difference each time with how you do it. So we'll say that road-like top is OK. I'll go ahead and say OK. And there is my resulting surface, kind of like a, a path or something that's going around a particular object. Okay, So that's when I switch to road-like top versus um, freeform. So now the other option, I'm going to duplicate an edge. So I'm going to type dupe edge, and I'm going to duplicate this edge right there. So that, and let me get rid of the original surface. Now I have both edges of that 
sweep. So there's technically two rails now. But I'm going to modify this one a bit. Or maybe actually I'm going to modify this one because it has fewer control points. It makes life a little bit easier. So let me take this and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger by moving these two points out. Like that. And you know what? Maybe I'll move these two points out a little bit too. Or for argument's sake, I'll move them closer. So I've manipulated those rails. They're no longer parallel. We've previously done a sweep one rail, where this rail has defined the sh with this cross section the end result. I can switch from a sweep one to a sweep two by going into surface sweep two rails this time. So the first rail would be this one. The second rail would be that one. So this is a little bit more like a railroad track where I have a rail on each side. But in this sense, when I go ahead and select the cross-sectional curve right there and press enter, there's my seam, I'll press enter, the cross-section is going to get larger as I get to the curves where they're further apart. So you see how that cross-section gets larger? It also gets kind of really funky in this section because they're getting closer together and not getting small enough. We have a couple other options here. Um, we, can, we can try to rebuild the cross sections. Uh, that's smoothing them out a little bit. Uh, refitting isn't going to help us too much. Um, but you guys get the idea here. So in this case, I'm not sure this ended up working out to turn out that well. I probably needed to make this bigger rather than smaller uh, to get a, a good result out of it. But I like to show you what the sweep one rail does. Oh, excuse me, the sweep two rails does versus the sweep one rail. The one last thing that I'm going to point out, let me go ahead and delete this. I'll delete the inner one. And that is that the cross-sectional curve does not have to be centered on or touching the rail itself. I could take this cross-sectional curve and I can move it so that it's not even close to where that rail would be. So it's floating out here in space. And I could do the same, sweep one. There's my rail, there's my cross-sectional curve enter, enter, and it's going to build it, maintaining the distance between this rail and my cross-sectional curve. So it's important to note that the relationship of the two doesn't have to be in the same uh, plane or attached to one another. Some, I think sometimes visually it makes sense to have it like, oh, it's at the center of this object or it's at the side of this object, but it doesn't have to be. And that's something that's important to, to keep in mind as we work through our sweeps. So I'm going to go ahead and delete those objects because they have nothing to do with what I was building, but I think it helps illustrate what a sweep is and how we work with a sweep. So there's my original object. I'm going to Z for uh, zoom, followed by S for selected to recenter my view around that particular object. And then I need to keep building. So at this point, I'm going to create a little button that goes on the end. That's kind of the clamp that holds the glass. So if we jump back to my images here, you can see that there's these little disks that kind of hold the glass. We're building those little disks right now. And so I'm going to do instead, I could um, extrude a curve, but I can also go into my standard uh, shapes and choose a cylinder because essentially that's what it is. So I'll pick cylinder. It's going to ask me for the base of the cylinder. I'm going to pick the very center of this object right there. Then it's going to ask me for a radius. So in here, I have the um, diameter set at an inch and a half, so the radius would be three quarters of an inch. Or I can click on diameter and choose 1.5. Next thing I need to do is I need to choose whether it is um, going down or going up. So in this case, it's going down, so I'll do a negative 0.25. So it's negative quarter of an inch going down. And that then creates this little button. I can do the same thing on the other end, or I could just mirror this to the other side. But for the repetition of it, I'll do it again. I'm going to choose to create another cylinder. I'm going to snap to this end point, I hope. In this case, it doesn't like me, so I might have to turn it upside down so I can see it there. There we go. I'm still in diameter mode at an inch and a half. That's great. And I'm going to be going down negative 0.25 to create that part of the clamp as well. So I have this button and I have this button. Now, the way that these clamps work, 
there's actually a hole in the glass. So the, this, this piece of metal is on one side of the glass, then there's a hole in the glass and the, the structure goes through, and then there's a clamp on the other side and the two press together to hold the glass. So I need to create another one of these that's down even a little bit further. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this one and I'm going to use the copy command. So I'll go to transform and then copy, point to copy from, and then I also have the ability to copy vertical. So in this case, vertical is a good idea. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on vertical and then point to copy from. It doesn't really matter where we pick. I'll say right there. And then I can specify a distance. Now I need there to be a half of an inch between these two. So a half an inch plus the quarter inch thickness of this would be three quarters of an inch. So I can type in 0.75 inches. Now when I do that, it's going to create that lower one. Oh, excuse me. I have to type in negative 0.75, my fault. There we go, now it creates that. I'll press delete. So I'll do that one again. I'll take the cylinder here. I'm gonna go to transform and then copy. Point to copy from, oh, I need to be vertical. We'll say right there. This needs to go down by 0.75 inches, so I need a negative 0.75 inches. And that then creates the lower part of this. So you can see that I've created this tube and then I've created these two clamps on either end to hold that panel of glass. Make sense so far? All right, so I have that. The next part of this, now that I've created this, is that I need one going in each direction. So this one here, I'm gonna ultimately rotate by 45 degrees. So I can go ahead and use my regular rotate. I'll go up to transform and then rotate. It's not a 3D rotate, it's just regular rotate. I can start right at my, um, my center, so I could snap right to the center there. I could also type in zero, zero. And this time, I'm going to start there and I'm gonna go up to 45 degrees. So this is a good opportunity to actually type in 45. So I'm gonna rotate by exactly 45 degrees. And now that one is rotated like that. I need a second copy of this so that I can have one going the opposite direction, going this way. So when I create that one, I have two different ways of doing it. I'm gonna show you both methods here. The first way would be to select my object. I'll go ahead and copy it. So I'll go to transform and copy and I'll pull it over here and I'll make a second copy. So there it is. Then I'll take this copy and I will rotate it. So I'll go to transform and then rotate and I'll rotate it right around the middle and so in this case, we're going this direction. I need to rotate it by uh, 180, or no, by 90, sorry. So I could just type in 90, and that would give me that shape. And then I can move it, again from the center, or the midpoint, so that it matches up with the midpoint over here. Now I'm having trouble snapping to this midpoint because I don't see the curve in here. So this is one where switching your view can be helpful. So we've been working primarily in shaded mode so far. But if instead of working in shaded mode, we work in a mode called ghosted, it's almost shaded mode, but we can see the curve through our objects a little bit. So our, our objects have a little bit of ghosting to them. That will allow us to pretty easily move from this middle and snap to that middle. And if I did this correctly, if I look at it from the top view, I should see a perfect little X there on a one foot square, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen. So the, I told you there were two different ways of doing this. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that piece and I'm gonna show you the other way. And this has to do with how efficient you can become as you start to work in Rhino. And it doesn't mean that you have to do it this way. There's nothing wrong with making a copy, rotating and then moving back. But what I would do if I were modeling is I would take this shape I would go up to copy. So I'd go to transform and then copy. And as soon as I'm in the copy command, I can type I or select this in place option. That means I don't need a base point, just make a copy right on top of itself. So I'll go ahead and click on that. It makes a copy right on top of itself. Notice that the object maintains its selection. So I still have it selected. I can then immediately go into rotate. So I can go to transform and then rotate. I can snap to my midpoint and I can say 90, 
and do my rotation. So I've saved the step of copy over here, rotate and move back. I've made a copy in place and just rotated the copy. So it's a more efficient way of, of working. It doesn't mean that it's the way you have to do it right now. I just like to introduce that as a concept for your modeling speed and technique. So at this point, I've made this uh, little X that's going to hold our glass. I need to make the uh, extension rod that comes up off the top of this. Uh, and that extension rod, if we flip the page over, is from the base, it's two feet to the center of the little uh, cable. Alternatively, from, our, um, from the top of our little spider clamp thing here, it's one foot nine and a quarter. So I'm going to go ahead and make it from the, the base, and then we'll trim it off afterward. And I'll do that by using the same commands that I've been doing. So the first one I'll choose is the polyline, and I'm just going to make it uh, flat on the ground here. I'll turn on ortho so that I'm straight, and I'll do this at two feet. There we go. And there's my polyline. Next thing I'll do is I'll create my uh, cross-sectional curve. And in this case, it is also a uh, half-inch diameter steel rod. So my diameter listed up there would be 0.5. There it is. I need to rotate that shape three-dimensionally so that it, it stands up. So I'd go to rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could rotate this line. Ultimately, the line's going to have to be rotated, so it might be more efficient to do it that way. I'll go to rotate 3D and stand this line up. So there's my axis of rotation. And we can stand that up so it's standing vertically. I could then do my sweep. So I'll go to surface, sweep one rail, rail, cross-sectional curve, enter, enter, and it creates oh, one more enter, and it creates that shape. Now, the astute observer here would say, well, wait a minute. Couldn't I also just go and create a cylinder right here with a diameter of 0.5 and a height of 2 feet? Absolutely. So this cylinder is exactly the same as this piece. The only difference is that this cylinder has a top and a bottom on it. We're going to get rid of the top and the bottom anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So that's the thing about Rhino. There's always multiple ways of creating a particular object. I like to show you this, and of course today I'm emphasizing the sweeps, so I'm going to keep doing it via sweeps. But I want you to be aware that, that is, uh, there are other options for how you would create this. So I now have this um, little riser here. And then I need a little donut on the end that's going to accept the cable into it. So I'm going to do that, and you can see it that the outside diameter of that little, um, the little donut is an inch and three quarters. So this would be an opportunity to use my curve. Once again, so I'm, I'm creating a circle. I'll snap right here to the center. And I would set my diameter at 1.75 inches. Now, in this view, I would have to, to then rotate 3D, so I go to transform, rotate 3D, and we'd stand this up so it was standing up like that. But if I initiated the circle command in this perspective view and then switched my view into, say, the front view, I wouldn't have to do that rotation. See how that changes? So I've changed the working view from perspective where I started down into this front view where I can just type in 1.75 inches and I now have, without having to do the 3D rotate, the shape in the correct direction. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm using the viewports to help myself out. So that's the outer diameter. The, the steel tension cable is only 3 eighths of an inch. That would be the inside diameter. So I could do the same thing. Let me snap to this point, and I'll move into the front view here. And in the front view, my diameter needs to be 3 eighths of an inch. So I could type 3 over 8. Or I could type in uh, 0.375 to get 3 eighths of an inch. Press enter. And there's that center cable right there. So if we look at it in perspective, we're seeing the center. We're seeing the outside diameter. Now we need one more circle that represents the cross section of this little donut that we're creating. So if I come back to the circle tool, we've been using the center 
the circle center and the radius. But notice hidden underneath, I have some other options, one of which is a circle with the diameter. If I pick that tool, I can actually snap from this edge over to that edge and create a, uh, a circle that's perpendicular to those two curves. If you're having trouble snapping, you can also turn on the quadrant snap, which will snap to the um, north, south, east, and west points on a circle. So I could go from there. Oh, sorry, wrong, uh, wrong tool. Let me click on this diameter circle and go from quadrant to quadrant like that. So this is set up for a sweep. I can sweep using the outer rail or I can sweep using the inner rail, neither of which, uh, either of which is perfectly fine. So I'm going to go ahead and go up to my sweep one rail. So I'll go to surface and then sweep one. There's my rail. There's my cross-sectional curve. I'll press enter and one more enter. And that gives me this little donut on the end. You do have in your shapes here, you have a uh, torus, which is essentially a donut. And so we could do the same thing using the torus tool if we wanted to. Interestingly enough, the sweep makes more intuitive sense to me. Like that's how I would build it. But that's again, just a preference. Okay, so if I start to look at this though, my steel rod that's coming up here intersects this torus or this donut at kind of a funky place. And we can see artifacts kind of poking through on the sides. So we need to do some trimming to clean it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to edit and then trim. My cutting object is going to be the donut or the torus. I'll press enter. And then I can get rid of wherever this rod kind of pokes out. So it pokes out there. That would be clean and through. But I could also take it a step further and get rid of that piece so that I end up with just where the two intersect down here at the bottom. That's a nice clean way of doing it. Go ahead and press enter to finish. And there it is. I could also use this object as a trim and get rid of the tiny little bit there such that those made a perfect seam. That's really unnecessary because you don't, you're not going to worry about it from a rendering standpoint, but I'm pointing it out anyway. So the next part of this is that this object, this one that I just created, needs to line up with this object right here. So if I were to take this object and I were to move it, let me go to transform and then move, I could snap from this right to the center of that. Now this is too tall because the, the, it's two feet from the, from the bottom up to the top uh, or from where the glass would be. So I actually need to move this down. And I happen to know how far down it is because I drew these curves to begin with. It's two inches. The alternative would be that you could move it and then use your side view as a reference point to get it to come down to where it would match those. So in that context, I would go ahead and start the move vertical. And we could say, I want to move from that point right there. But then I could come in here and reference. See how I can reference one of these points? So I could reference right there on the spider or right there on the spider and actually have that snap as it's coming down. So I'm using this view to help guide my placement. So there it is, placed. But again, I have this object fully intersecting with these two objects. So I need to do some cleanup. Let me go ahead and go to trim. I'm going to select uh, this curve and or this curve. I actually think it's easier to do it one at a time. So I'm going to do just this curve. I'll press enter. And then I can trim off that lower part right there. And when I do that, it trims all the way up. You kind of see where it intersects there like that. I could reach in here a little bit more and I could try to get rid of more of that. Let's see where the holdover part is. There's a little bit there. That's a little bit there. Whoops, too far. Undo. Right. So in that context, I need to trim it a little bit more 
you could see, let me, let me illustrate this for just a second. If I hide this, you can see where the intersection has happened with just those two objects. And actually there's a little bit on this back side that I should get rid of. So let me type trim and I can get rid of that part of the object there. So you can see how those two are intersecting right now. If I type show, I get the object back and I could then fix it for this object. So let me hide. Now you can see it against this. I would need to do a little bit more trimming here. So I could say that's my cutting object, trim, and we could get rid of that piece and that piece. It doesn't really matter to trim it all the way as long as you've trimmed it off the bottom and you're not seeing it from the bottom. Let me go back to show, and now I have those two pieces there all trimmed out and nice and neat. I could take it a step further and I could trim out these pieces as well where those two intersect. That would be reasonable. Um, so I could go into a trim and I could say, okay, I want to get rid of that piece there and I want to get rid of that piece there. And then I could use this and this as a trim for that piece and that piece. Essentially, you get how I'm working through this. Again, those are all unnecessary, but it's not bad practice to learn how this trim process works. And essentially, what we've ended up doing is we've made it so that there's nothing inside this. It's all hollow um, as they come together. Okay, so I've gone through and I've done that part of it. I don't need this curve anymore. That's pretty good. All right, I'd like for the center of this to fall right at zero, zero or the center of my glass to fall at the bottom of this point, one or the other. So let's go ahead and create the piece of glass. I'm going to just use a box corner to corner. And for, for the ease of snapping, I'll go ahead and snap right to the midpoint there. And so this piece of glass is going to be four feet by six feet. So I can go ahead and type in at relative coordinate here, four feet in the X comma six feet in the Y. And my thickness is going to be a half inch, so 0.5. And I'll go ahead and press enter, and that gives me that pane of glass right there. This needs to be moved down so that it falls in the center of those little buttons. So I'm going to go ahead and type move, or go to transform and then move. And I will specify that this is a vertical move, which it is. And I want it to move down so that it references, and you can see me doing this here, so that it references right there, which means that the, the spider is going to fall exactly on either side of that glass. Okay, so that falls there. That's nice. You can kind of see how this is going to work because if I were to take this object and copy it and put it up here, I'd get another of that object and they would tile together as I make it a much larger wall. That's the idea here. So I'm going to go ahead with this object and I'm going to add a little bit of steel cable going up here. So I'm going to do one more sweep. I'm going to do a line right from the center. There it is. And that's going to be at six feet so that it matches the height of the, whoops, so that it matches the height, oh, come on, of the glass, six feet in that direction. Press enter. I already have the little circle from when I created the donut or the torus. And I can do that using a sweep. So I'll do a sweep one, my rail, followed by my cross-sectional curve right there. I'll press enter and then one more enter and OK. And I end up with that steel cable going up on the side here. So I've now made all the geometry that I need to make. The last thing I need to do is just kind of put it into uh, view so that I can kind of see what it would look like. Uh, do a little rendering of it, etc. So the rendering is going to be a little tricky because we're, we don't have any context. Glass is always hard when there's no context around it. So we're going to give it a few shots and see if we can't make it look okay. I'm going to go ahead and rotate it up first. So I'm going to go into my uh, transform. I'm going to go to rotate 3D. And I'm going to stand this little piece up so that it's standing up vertically. I'm going to go ahead and move it vertical so that it's above the ground plane since it's hanging down there a little bit. And then I'll add, just like we have done in the past, I'm going to add a V-Ray infinite plane underneath for my rendering. I'm going to add a basic directional light, but I'll use my little box to set that up for myself. So there's my box. I'll click on the directional light tool, low corner to high corner, 
Now my directional light is, is falling down on my object. That's good. I'm going to go into my V-Ray options. Oh, that's right. V-Ray didn't want to load for me. Uh, I'm going to save this right now. I'm going to open Rhino again, see if V-Ray will, will load. Give me just a second to save this on my flash drive first. All right, let me close uh, Rhino and let me open it again and see if V-Ray will load correctly this time. I'm going to go to File and then Open and open that file that I was just working on. Oh, looks like we're still having V-Ray issues. So um, I will sort, try to sort out what's going on there um, and why. If it's working for you, that's great. I can't demo anything further because V-Ray won't open. <laughs> so uh, this is as far as I can go for right now unless I can get it coming back. So I will try to do that and maybe after a restart or something. Um, and I'll show you the, the rest of the materials. If, if V-Ray is not working for you, uh, worst case is we'll just do a capture to file. So I'll use my little downward um, arrow here. I'll go to capture and then to file. I'll save that and post that for today. Okay. I'll try to figure out why V-Ray is not working for me uh, and what the issue is. Hopefully we can get it fixed by next class, which is when we're going to go back into V-Ray um, to deal with texture mapping. Okay. Are there any uh, questions before I turn you guys loose? I know it's a lot to take in, but I'm starting to transfer the uh, power of how you build these things to you versus to me. So I'm going to try to demo it, and then you guys can try to do it on your own, which is part of how you learn uh, to model in Rhino in the first place. Okay, I'll let you guys start working.